From Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus with Paul Salem. Welcome to Middle East Focus. Uh, Today we're going to look again uh, into the uh, Iran protests, what they might mean the long term internally as well as regionally and internationally. I'm very thrilled to have with me today Barbara Slavin, our good friend Barbara Slavin, who's the director of the Future of Iran Initiative at the Atlantic Council. Welcome, Barbara. And with us by Skype is my colleague Alex Vitanka, who's the director of our uh, uh, Iran uh, work here at the Middle East Institute. Welcome, Alex. Thank you, Paul. So these protests, uh, maybe the biggest wave of sort of protests in Iran since 2009, broke out uh, December 28, uh, late last year. Over 80 towns and cities seem to be involved. Really quite a development, quite different than the 2009 protests, apparently, both in terms of what they were about. 2009 was about sort of the elections. This was sparked more by social, economic and budget issues. And also uh, the people who participated, different crowds than uh, than those that participated in 2009. 25 dead, 4,000 arrested, although many of them seem to have been released. So let's uh, get into it. Let me start with you, Barbara. In a bit of retrospect, it's only been, you know, a couple of weeks, but how do you explain the various parts of how this evolved into the big event that it was? Well, thanks, Paul, first of all, for having me uh, join you. There have been numerous reports that these began with a political protest in a way by hardline factions that are opposed to President Hassan Rouhani. Mm -hmm. That began with a small demonstration in Mashhad, which is uh, a conservative bastion in eastern Iran. And then guess what? The slogans they were chanting, particularly the economic slogans, caught on. And thanks to Telegram, social media, spread like wildfire to smaller towns and cities that had not been part of the 2009 protests. So in a way, maybe it was kind of a regime-owned goal, if you want, in the the sense that one faction, let's say, was going after maybe President Rouhani, but unexpectedly it triggered something much wider. Who were the populations? You said it spread widely into towns and cities. How was that different than 2009? 2009 was concentrated in Tehran. You had millions coming out in Tehran. It was concentrated in the middle, upper middle class, educated uh, class that was furious uh, over fraud in the election. This time, Tehran remained relatively quiet. There were some demonstrations, but they were very small. And uh, why is that? I mean, well, why didn't they jump on the bandwagon? You know, I think there are a number of reasons, uh, and I'd be here, interested to hear Alex's view. Uh, partly it was concern over stability, that this might uh, cause chaos and violence. And Iran, of course, has seen what's happened in Syria and other places. And and most Iranians, I think, don't want to see that sort of thing happen yeah. in, in Iran. The middle classes, upper middle classes are not doing great, but they've seen some benefit perhaps from the nuclear deal, which we'll talk about later. Mm-hmm. But that's not trickled down. The oil revenue has not trickled down to these provincial areas. Uh, we have other Factors, climate change, tremendous problems with water in the, shortages. In the provinces, in the provinces yeah, you know, these, yeah. this is flyover country. This is the, these are the places the that forgotten, have been, maybe, yeah. been forgotten, uh, that have been ta- uh, taken for granted, I mm-hmm. think, by the regime, the regime's base that you could always call out for, for protests in support of the regime. Interesting. So I, I've written, and I think in some ways it's a much more serious challenge to the system. Uh, it may not lead to revolution tomorrow, but there are real grievances that have to be addressed. Oh. Alex, uh, let's turn to you in, again, some retrospect. What have you surmised now that wasn't obvious in the first few days? What are the takeaways of what this was about for you? You know, one of the things that stands out for me, Paul, is this notion that oftentimes you hear in sort of the, in the West among the intellectual classes and and frankly, among many of us Iran watchers, this notion that North Tehran, which has historically has been the sort of bastion of opposition sentiment against the Islamic Republic, that North Tehran is just a small geographic location. The rest of the country seems to be fine with the Islamic Republic, how it performs. Now, I think these protests clearly show to us that no, actually, the less rest of the country might have the same kind of anger built inside it as North of Tehran. The big difference is North of Tehran Largely, they are well-to-do people who are not necessarily driven by economic grievances first and foremost, but the fact is they have a very kind of a tense relationship with the Islamic Republic. And now the rest of the country, who, uh, based on what we've seen so far, 
initially came out because of economic grievances. But as we know, economic grievances very quickly turned into political grievances. And Paul, we talked about 2009. One of the things that is different here, uh, which is maybe an important point, is 2009 was a family feud. It was a fight within the Islamic Republic, within factions of the Islamic Republic. It was not the YouTube revolution. It was not a Twitter revolution. It was a faction around Ayatollah Rafsanjani, who was alive then, who basically came out against the second uh, term of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. And that's how it sort of started. And it took six months for the regime to crack down. This time around was nothing to do with a family feud as such. And we don't really know this for, for sure. It might have started that way in Mashhad initially. But the way it, as Barbara put it, became this wildfire and took over 80, 90, 100 cities were impacted shows the, you know, the big difference between what happened in 2009. Alex, I want to just, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about maybe the regime factionalization in a moment. But I want to ask you about these protesters, we call them in the provinces. I mean, that's not the best term, but uh, not the northern Tehran ones. Obviously, there's a lot of socioeconomic grievance. Did that, I mean, maybe the simplified version is northern Tehran type people maybe are a bit more kind of secular. Maybe they don't, you know, favor the Islamic Republic aspect so much. Is the divide that the sort of the protesters this time were mainly focused on socioeconomic and political, but not in terms of not being for the Islamic Republic, but just not being for corrupt government. Is that a correct distinction? I think there's a lot of truth in that. And I'll put this on, on top of what you just said, Paul. These youngsters, and they were by and large demographically very young crowds, they have overtaken north of Tehran. They've re overtaken the secular part of the Iranian uh, population. Some of the slogans we heard come out of these protests, and I don't want to exaggerate the extent of this, but some of it certainly that were circulating in social media weren't just about, you know, Rouhani and Khamenei, the supreme leader. In some cases, we heard slogans about take Islam, the religion of Islam, out of Iran and take it back to Arabia. This <laughs> wow. to me suggests there is a generation of Iranians, they might be on the margins now and they might remain on the margins. I have no way of knowing. But certainly the anger is such that they are going all the way out. We never heard back in 2009 people saying, get Islam out of Iran. This, this is a, and I wonder if this is something worth watching because the people who are in the streets to, to 2017, 2018, they were in, teenagers. They were 10, 12, 13, 14 years old in 2009. And they certainly have no historical memory of 1979 when Ayatollah Khomeini came. So what is going to shape these people is going to paramount in terms of their political disposition uh -huh. as they grow up in life. Barbara, I heard you uh, hemming or hawing. Uh, a little anyway. bit there. Comments. I mean, you know... Uh... I don't think the, the system has been popular for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly, you know, since I started going to Iran in 1996, I've heard complaints about the Arabs bringing Islam <laughs> to Iran in the seventh century. Uh, tremendous resentment of the Islamic Republic, uh, tremendous resentment of hijab, of all the rules, restrictions, and so on. So I'm not surprised to hear that people are calling mm -hmm. for a, an a Iranian republic, not an Islamic republic. That's not a new slogan. But, uh, you know, it is – what's interesting is that it's coming from the provinces. These were areas we thought were, were somewhat less secular, more religious. And mm -hmm. clearly now we see that this is a vast movement. I've always said that Iran is the most secular country in the Middle East mm -hmm. um, that I visited. And that's if you try to force feed religion to people, they'll get more secular. They yeah. tend to get more secular. <laughs> yeah. If you try to take it away, they tend to get more religious. Mm. It's just mm. you know the persnicketiness of the human condition. So I'm not <laughs> I'm not I'm not surprised by that. Um, I think we we have seen some steps, and I've written about this sort of virtuous competition between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Yeah, I've seen yeah. That. yeah. <laughs> we've seen some steps now uh, to lighten the heavy hand of the morality police. Uh, certainly hijab rules went out the window years ago. If mm -hmm. you see how women dress in Iran now, it has very little to do with the hijab. Um, you know, public concerts. And uh, I hope we see more of this because you can't have a rotten economy and social repression as well. And, you got to you know, give somewhere. Something yeah. has to give. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see whether Rouhani can open that space a little more. Well, let me ask you, Barbara, I mean, when one looks at in a way, the history of revolts or revolutions, remember a great book by Fida Scotchpole that I read in graduate school, that in a sense, revolutions only happen 
from the top in the sense when there's a problem at the top, then popular unrest ends up meaning something. Uh, that in many cases, you know, people are unhappy, they protest, you know, pretty regularly, especially if the economy is is bad and so on. But it's only when really there's infighting at the top mm -hmm. and a state cannot manage the situation when that it's only then that something big kind of happens historically and so on. And so my question to Barbara and then to Alex, uh, again, with a bit of retrospect, where does the the Islamic Republic's various figures, pillars, I mean, we see Rouhani now kind of taking on, being a bit critical of others. And you said, you know, as we've read, maybe things started in Mashhad uh, as an attack on Rouhani. Uh, and looming, as Alex always reminds me, looming over all of this is the day when the Supreme Leader Khamenei will be no longer. So there's a struggle for the future in a sense. So Barbara, how do you read the Islamic Republic's, if you want to call them factions at this point? There's always been a struggle going on in Iran. This is I mean, maybe in the at, you know the the height of the revolution when the revolution succeeded. You had two minutes of unity, and then everybody <laughs> began attacking each other. Sort of like uh, the Trump administration. Uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, the Islamic Republic was very efficient in the mm -hmm. first few years in kind of eliminating the Islamic left, the the commie, communists, the this, the that, and then once it got down to sort of the so-called loyal core, they of course were fighting with each other. So mm -hmm. factionalism is nothing new in Iran. But you, you pointed out, and Alex, I think, has spoken about this as well, that in a sense we are in the struggle already for succession to the supreme leader. Uh, will there be a single supreme leader? Will the nature of that position change? At the same time, of course, Rouhani is fighting for economic reforms. Mm -hmm. Remember, he's the one who leaked the budget, showing all this money going yeah. to the Revolutionary and Guard the, the and trigger. the religious foundations, yeah. right? And, and you know, people want to tax these foundations. They've not been taxed. So you have kind of multiple struggles. And on top of that, you have whether Iran can be integrated into the international economy or whether the United States is, is effectively blocking that mm. and will continue and to we'll block get that. get to the U.S. for the moment. So yeah. you have all these struggles going on at the same time and people have different views. Rouhani, I have always found him to be a very savvy operator. People complain that he says one thing and does another, but I think he's playing the long game. And I think he has a fairly firm view of how he sees the Islamic Republic evolving. And the question is, will he be able to get there or will he be overwhelmed either by opposition within the regime or by popular protest? Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm waiting to see. Alex, what's your view? I mean, where does Rouhani stand now? Is he stronger, weaker? What is he doing? And where do the Revolutionary Guards stand politically, let's say, uh, at this point? Let me just say one thing about Khamenei, the supreme leader. Uh, he's been there, let's just remember, for about 30 years, three times longer than the guy who founded the Islamic Republic, Ayatollah Khomeini. Khomeini was supreme leader. For most of that time, Iran was in a crisis mode, mostly because of the Iran-Iraq war. And Khamenei took, takes over uh, basically peacetime, if you will. So much of the upheaval, both at home and Iranian foreign policy, are by choice. Because Mr. Khamenei has decided, for the most of his time in office, to be an ideological person, as opposed to somebody who focuses on the ordinary issues that we saw the protesters complain about, the economy, making sure that there are enough pe for people to eat. So Khamenei is not innocent here. I wonder, I don't know if it's too late, I wonder if this might be a moment for him to sort of start thinking about his legacy, because he is somebody who took over from the guy, the Shah, who said just weeks before he fell to, to, to his own people, I have heard your revolution. In the case of the Shah, it was too late and he was toppled. Khamenei, this is him hearing his people. I just wonder if he's going to do anything different. Now, turning to Rouhani, mm -hmm. this is also a big moment for him. Rouhani can become his own man. I think I agree with Barbara. He's savvy, but sometimes he's a bit too savvy. Certainly, Iranian people see him being too savvy. They want him to stand up to Khamenei. They want him to sort of say to Khamenei, the way Ahmadinejad used to say in his second term, look, I got 24 million votes. And people of Iran, like Rouhani, the candidate, a heck of a lot more than Rouhani, the, 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 who was in the presidential palace. They want you to actually fulfill some of your pledges. Can you do it? And if you cannot, please, sir, step aside. Let somebody else come in or let this let the streets take over. Alex, to simplify, if I simplify the question a little bit, did anybody, uh, any faction win this or did they all 
are they all a little bit losers? If they're all in the in the business of tactics, I'm sure somebody won. You know, Revolutionary Guards can turn around and say, certainly that's the message that's coming through the Revolutionary Guards controlled media, that everything can be blamed on Rouhani and his, mm-hmm. you know, promises that were never fulfilled and so on. But that's the game of tactics. If you look at it strategically, if this is one big ship called the Islamic Republic, then all these factions will be washed away if the whole system collapses. And that we are at that point. We are at a point, I think, and people might disagree, but I think we're at a very critical point, certainly going forward. I'm not promising the top leg of the regime anytime soon. That has been said and has never been done for many times over. But I think what you're seeing now is a new generation coming through the pipes that are simply too tired of promises and priorities by a regime that doesn't really look deep inside what makes its own people get up in the morning. And the stuff that Iran is doing in Syria or producing number of clerics and uh, propagating Shia Islam, that's not the stuff your average Iranian really cares about. And that's the challenge for all of them, for the Revolutionary Guards, for Khamenei Rouhani. Get that message. They might be able to control the situation. If not, then you can expect more protests just down the road. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Barbara, let me turn to the U.S. uh, and its Iran policy, such as it can be uh, figured out, as it were. And let me just zero in on the, uh, the nuclear deal with Iran, which is kind of the pillar of everything, and a policy which remains, you know, month after month, basically unclear. (laughs) Uh, with the latest waiver, but the president saying, it's my last waiver, and this happens every three months. Where are we headed in in Trump administration Iran policy? Well, you know, I think Trump has already succeeded in undermining the benefits of the the deal for Iran. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe that was his goal. Maybe he's not savvy enough himself to understand that was his goal, but mm-hmm. that that's what he's achieved. Ever since he was inaugurated, ever since he uh, imposed the travel ban as one of his first acts, he has cast a cloud of uncertainty over the deal. So it almost doesn't matter whether the U.S. sort of formally, you know, pulls out or not. I'm waiting to see what the Europeans are going to do. Mm-hmm. The way it was phrased in Trump's statement, I think the Europeans could agree to negotiate some sort of understanding with the United States um, that would not directly contradict the the Iran deal uh, on on steps if Iran were to ever you know try to build a nuclear weapon maybe that would satisfy him mm-hmm. I don't know he's such an odd character so erratic and emotional uh, it's hard think, to tell I mean I know it's com- impossible to predict but do you think this will be in a way, the, the, the normal for the Trump administration, keeping the deal technically, but mucking around and clouding it and impacting elements of it, but keeping the deal, even though he said this might be my last waiver? Well, it's probably the best case scenario. Yeah. Uh, you know, we'll see. He, this is, he said in October that if Congress didn't act, he would terminate the deal. Yeah. Congress didn't act, he didn't terminate it. Now he said, this is the last time I will issue these waivers. So... You know, we so will we'll see. have to wait and see. He's a man of surprises, no doubt about that. Alex, let me turn to you. Uh, U.S.-Iran policy beyond the nuclear deal. Uh, you know, General Mattis and others have always been pretty hawkish on Iran. Uh, there's Iranian, you know, support, proxies, presence in Iraq, uh, Syria, Lebanon, support in Yemen. Uh, is there either in year one of the Trump administration or something coming down the line in year two uh, that relates to, you know, pushing back on Iran or some new initiatives in that area? You know, uh, first I say this, Paul, I agree with what Barbara just said. In terms of the nuclear deal, Trump is in a good position. Whether he wanted to be here or not, or this is by accident, doesn't matter. The fact is that the number of European Asian business delegations going to Tehran has dropped significantly over the course of the last year. That is having an impact in the Iranian economy. That means you're not creating enough jobs in Iran, which means the political tensions in Iran build up. And maybe Mr. Trump will get what he wants, regime change from within, and he doesn't have to fire a single bullet. That would be a best case scenario for Mr. Trump. But I'm just saying on the nuclear deal, he doesn't necessarily have to do much up into May or even beyond that. But in terms of what's coming up the pipeline, I mean, look, if you look at the U.S. national strategy that was just unveiled a few weeks ago, when you look at that and you, if you're expecting the big strategic blueprint of this is how we're going to go in against Iran, not just on the nuclear issue, but Iran across the board in the Middle East, in Syria, in the, in the Persian Gulf region, so on, that is... I'm not seeing that one big strategic blueprint's not there. And it's probably because it's very difficult. Iran is not a, it's not North Korea. It's not limited to a single issue in a very small 
relatively small geographic location as North Korea is. Iran is all over the place in West Asia. How do you deal with it? There are so many actors involved. There are so many American interests involved. But I think until President Trump at least decides what he wants, because right now, just for a second, imagine you're sitting back in Tehran. You could legitimately ask yourself the question, Was this, what, what is it Trump wants? For us to give him a sun, sunset clause that goes beyond 2025 to 2100? Or does he want us to recognize, I don't know, the state of Israel or get out of Yemen? I mean, what is it Trump wants? And I think that creates so much uncertainty in Tehran as well that they then start fearing that what Trump really wants is regime change, but he's just taking steps uh, one at a time. And therefore, the Iranians might be reluctant to do anything because they fear this potential end game. And uh, as I said, they, they, they don't want to go there. That's a very good point. I mean, uh... I always think that, you know, uh, I mean, the objective with Iran is changing their behavior and doing that just by threatening and bluster and pushback and threatening JCPOA without some kind of diplomatic initiative to indicate, well, what is it that would, as you said, either in this case, satisfy the Trump administration, you know, to work it out to something that's livable rather than just escalation uh, across the board, because as you say, that escalation impacts the you know Yemen, who's already in an enormous disaster, impacts Syria, impacts uh, uh, Iraq, impacts Lebanon, could impact Israel. Uh, well, that's all the time we have, uh, Barbara and Alex. Barbara, thank you so much for joining us here today on this chilly DC uh, uh, morning. Uh, Alex, you thank have you. the luxury of being in your warm home. We thank <laughs> you for joining us via Skype. Thank you, Paul. And uh, thank you, our listeners, for tuning in. Uh, if you have comments or suggestions, you can go to our Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash Middle East Institute. Uh, thank you all for tuning in today and see you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.